preemption and occupation. A lot of us don't even feel we should be armed to defend ourselves. Nonviolence and democracy are what we want to use as we live together in a society. And we want to preserve unions. We want to protect the environment. We want decent housing, education, health care. Stop the exploitation of people who were innocently led down the road to unjust foreclosures. Give our students, as the European students, other industrialized countries have, an opportunity for a higher education without saddling them with extremely burdensome loans. And there are other very good objectives that were enunciated before I got up here today, and I'm sure in earlier meetings of Occupy Boston. I share all of those, but I want to try to offer a practical, realistic, pragmatic way to get them. Something we can unite on without having to choose among those reforms. And that is public financing of elections. Now, now, those reforms come up in Congress. People propose those reforms in state legislatures, and they all go down to defeat. Why? Because the members of Congress, the members of the legislature, owe their successful elections and re-elections to the 1% whose private contributions become, in effect, the tie that binds them to the policies that the 1% want and against what's fair for the people. We'll never get those reforms that we all want enacted into law democratically, and I think most of us prefer evolution over revolution. That will never happen until we get the money out of elective politics. There's an unholy alliance between the 1% who support the incumbents and the, 90, and the uh, uh, incumbents who feel they can't get re-elected unless they vote the way the 1% wants. There's an old saying, uh, I hope I'm not going to date myself, that says, uh, he who pays the fiddler calls the tune. Well, if Big Pharma and Big Oil and the Koch brothers have been responsible for the senators and the representatives' election and re-election and election and re-election, they're going to vote the way they want against the interest of the people. What happens um, and why can't challenges, newcomers, defeat the lackeys of the 1%? I saw that, as I say, when I ran for the Massachusetts legislature. If you consider running and your consultants tell you you need X number of thousand of dollars to even have a chance to get name recognition as a new challenger, and then you look at the public records of what a war chest your incumbent opponent has already amassed, you say to yourself and to your consultant, say when you face these war chests of money, the fundraisers produce and the solicitations produce, do I have a chance to win? And if you have an honest, good consultant, I'll tell you not really, but why don't you run once, you'll lose, run again, you get a little name recognition, you should live so long, you might come close, keep running. That's not realistic, and that doesn't do the job. The incumbent is still re-elected. What you have to do, and what my consultant told me is, you've got to play the money game, the capitalist game. You've got to find some rich people like the Cokes to underwrite your campaign. You've got to spend a half of your time campaigning, dialing the phone for dollars. 
I tried the best I could. What a demeaning experience. Calling up practical strangers and saying, I'm Jules Levine, I'm a good person. I worked and I studied hard and I graduated from Harvard College and Harvard Law School and I got a PhD at Oxford and I've given up uh, the private practice full time so I don't make as much money as a law professor at BU and I'd like to now do public service in a more direct way. Will you contribute to me? Who are you, they say? Um, you know, you get a few. And I don't think I'm alone. I mean, I get discouraged. Even Governor Patrick, who had won election to governor in 2008, I think it was, so the anecdote goes, had a minute to chat privately, or at least almost alone, with President Obama when he was here to campaign for Martha Coakley running for senator in 2010. At that time, Patrick hadn't decided or announced whether he was going to run for re-election. And so what I have tenth hand is the president said, you know, how are things, Deval? They're, they're friends from Harvard Law School. And Deval said, fine. And he's, the president said, I understand you're doing a good job as governor. Your ratings are up in the polls. Yeah, he said, so I assume you'll be running for re-election. Well, the governor said to his president, friend, the president, I'm not sure. I might not. The president says, why not? Well, he said, I hate to ask people for money. Of course, we know in the end he did, and he won, and he's a good governor. But for everyone who is a friend who's a president in other ways of making up for not being rich themselves or not having the rich backers, there are so many more who would be honest, upright legislators, but they never get a chance to win. That's why, for example, in Massachusetts for the legislature, about 75% of the state senators and representatives run every two years unopposed, no matter how bad they are, no matter how much they want to trample on the futures of our children and grandchildren. And it gets worse when there is a challenge, as I did, 90% of the incumbents beat the challengers. Not only because of the war chests and the moneyed interest behind them, but even the do-gooder organizations, even the pressure groups, like the Sierra Club, NARAL, unions, you can go on and on, turn out to do two things that makes it hard to beat an incumbent, as happened to me. They always send you a beautiful questionnaire. It looks fair. As a candidate, you spend time, you fill it in, and you mostly answer about how you would vote on the particular issue that pressure group works for. I did. I spent time for it, and I sent it in. And a couple of those groups didn't endorse at all, which was something of a victory for a challenger, but more did. And not only does their endorsement help defeat the, cha the uh, challenger, but they send letters to their members and ask them to vote against the challenger. So after I had lost by less than 1%, I happened to meet the executive director of one of those organizations. And by then I knew that my opponent's answers to that questionnaire were far less dedicated to their issue than I was, and I sincerely was. And I said, can you explain why you endorsed against me? And she said, it's not you, Jules, it's not you. Don't take it personally. But all of our organizations know that 90% of the incumbents, whoever do get a challenge, and that's only 25% of them, they always win. So we owe it to our members to endorse them so we'll have some cachet with them when we bring our bills to them in the legislature. So it's a very uphill battle to ever dislodge the reps and the senators that are put into office by the 1%. The other very surprising thing I learned in my campaign was that after I'd raised some money, and I had to report it, as my opponent does, at least we have that much electoral reform in this state, publicly, 
I knew who had contributed to me, and I went to the uh, office of the OCPF in the State House area and looked at the reports by my opponent. They weren't online then. This was 1996. So I went up there in person, and I saw who endorsed him, and I wasn't too happy, perhaps. So then I came to one that was one of my biggest in, uh, in, uh, one of my biggest contributors, and that contributor had also uh, contributed to my opponent. In other words, they don't really care who it is. They want to enslave whoever's going to be in the place where the votes are going to come to defeat the reforms that we want. And that's perfectly okay in capitalistic elections, right? Nothing wrong, no, not unethical, uh, not illegal. Um, As I said at the beginning, and as one or two of the speakers preceding me had said, capitalism has really usurped democracy. I may be oversimplifying this, and some of the speakers before me were very eloquent on this, but it's not really my subject, so I'm not going to try to amplify it. But I learned as a major in uh, economics in college that capitalism is a system of producing and delivering goods and services that consumers buy. That's not democracy. Democracy is a system of letting all the governed have an equal say through their equally important vote at every election. That's not so. You don't have that now when the incumbents and the people favored by the moneyed interest are pledged and always do unless it's a safe vote, because the vote is going to go the other way anyway, and they can make believe that they voted the right way, they always vote for the 1%. <clears throat> okay. I heard uh, Herman Cain, a, a candidate for presidential nomination in the Republican Party, asked what he thought of the occupation movement, Occupy movement. And Herman Cain, who prides himself on saying he'd be a real businessman, that is, a capitalist, as president, if he were elected, he said, oh, that Occupy movement is unconstitutional and un-American. And the media person said, why, Mr. Cain? He said, because they violate the Constitution. They want to end or radically change capitalism. Well, I looked at the Constitution, and I didn't find the word capitalism there at all, or even free enterprise. Uh, but I'm not a constitutional scholar. I'm a trial lawyer, and I sometimes have to handle constitutional issues a little bit. But I was glad to see because I didn't research all the case law, which can really put layers of uh, sometimes surprising meaning on clauses of the Constitution. I didn't research it to be sure that Mr. Cain was way off base in saying people that want to exercise their rights of free speech and free assembly are acting unconstitutionally. But I happened to see that a classmate of mine, both at Magdalen College and Oxford University in England and at Harvard Law School, who was now and, and, and who was a professor at Harvard Law School, now one of the justices of the U.S. Supreme Court, Steve Breyer, was asked by the Tunisians who were fashioning their new constitution what a constitution, what the American constitution contains. And he said, well, really, there are just five short principles. First, democracy. Second, protecting human rights. Third, division of powers. Fourth, equality. And fifth, the rule of law. There's no capitalism there. There's no choice between competing economic systems in our Constitution. <clears throat> and it has infiltrated insidiously our elections and corrupted them. We've got to restore democracy in order to get our reforms. In order to get the end of wars, to get wealth equity, to get 
relief under foreclosure, to get student loans, to get all the other good things we need, we've got to change our method of electing our public officials. Congress could have done it, and the state legislatures could have done it, and they haven't, and they won't, unless we change it. I can't tell you it's easy to change our federal Congress, or that together we can do it. It's not. It's harder than to change our state legislatures. That's because the United States Supreme Court and my friend Justice Breyer voted against it and my friend Justice Souter voted against it, but they only had two votes out of nine. Our U.S. Supreme Court has issued a line of decisions since 1976 which mistakenly say that money is free speech and therefore, in effect, Congress cannot pass laws getting money out of the electoral process. The only way to have that done is to have a constitutional amendment. And a colleague at Harvard Law School, Lawrence Lessing, and others are working on bringing about a constitutional amendment. You can do that two ways. I remember that much from law school. Either Congress passes it by two-thirds to start it off, they'll never do it, or you get uh, three-quarters of the states, I think it's 34, to call for a constitutional convention. And Lawrence Lessing and uh, his supporters are working on getting that vote by states, state by state. They have an organization called Fix Congress First, affectionately known as the Root Strikers, striking at the root of our problems. And I hope you will help that movement and from whatever states you hail, work to get your state to ask for a convention to be able to amend the Constitution. However, however, there is something we can do in regard to the state legislatures right away, or more precisely over the two-year election cycle that the state reps and senators have. That's because to change our method of state legislature elections, all we need is a majority vote of the House and the Senate and the governor signing the bill. Very fast, very easy, done all the time for the 1%. And how can we get it done for the 99%? We get it done by public financing, by passing that law by a majority vote. Other states have done it, not a lot. It's hard to buck the 1%. But where it's been done, Connecticut, Maine, Arizona, New York City, Los Angeles City, other places, studies have found, included by the well-respected Brennan uh, Institute for Brennan Center for Justice of the NYU Law School, that there are two beneficial effects. One is that good legislation is not defeated on the altar of money. And it passes. Ours would pass. The second thing that happens is there are no, not 25% of the members of the legislature without any opponent every year. Far higher percentage of challenges opposed because of what the public financing law does is it gives each candidate the same amount of money in general and prohibits any private contributions for the campaigns of anybody. So the 1% are not allowed to buy the reps and senators and thereby buy the votes against the reforms we all work for.